God is saying many things today, things that are different and therefore controversial. Many Christians today are looking for answers to questions nobody wants to deal with. The truth will always be sufficient for what you need. The kingdom of God is alive and well on the earth today, and it is our desire that these teachings will help you in your quest for the truth. In the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the writer tells us that there's a time to leave the elementary doctrines and go on unto perfection or to maturity. Many believers know that there's more than what they are experiencing, more to the way of life in the Lord than they have been living. But in the normal church culture, even the elementary doctrines have not been taught. In the sixth chapter of Hebrews, as we said, the list of what constitutes the elementary doctrines is, is noted. There are six of them. Here they are. Repentance from acts that lead to death, faith toward God, baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Six. Now we have so far discussed repentance from acts that lead to death and faith toward God. Now we're going to speak of the doctrine of baptisms. At this juncture, it is common for people to think, oh, this is too archaic. This is just too, too old-fashioned. Who, who wants to know about baptisms? And, you know, we were baptized as infants or we were baptized later on in life when we were adults. That's just something you had to do. Why visit baptisms? Well, first note that he says baptisms, plural. So it means that there are a number of baptisms. Baptism is death and resurrection. Quite literally, baptism is the immersion of a thing in another so that the thing immersed is changed by the thing in which it's immersed. So baptism is meant to result in change. Change. It's not just something you do, like get it going under the water, coming up out of the water. Baptism is meant to impart to you a foundation of change. Now, here are some of the baptisms that we must speak of. First, I'd like for us to speak about baptism of the Spirit. Second, I'd like for us to speak about baptism by the Spirit. The two words of and by are very different references and have totally different meanings. Baptism of the Spirit, baptism by the Spirit. Then I wish for us to speak about baptism in fire or the baptism of fire. And then fourth, baptism in water. Now, as I have said, all of these doctrines of baptism are meant to result in a certain particular change. Here at the beginning, I would like to summarize what each of these baptisms is supposed to, what change they're supposed to impart to you. First, baptism of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit baptizes, when you are baptized by the Spirit, that is meant to result in a change from your being powerless to your being powerful. It's also meant to relate to a change from you being outside and, and, and lost and sinful 
to your being confirmed as a child of God. Baptism by the Spirit is supposed to result in a change from you being your own person, living your own life the way you want to, to your being placed in your place in the body of Christ so that you may pick up your destiny and live it out to the fullness thereof. Because you see, before you were born, God had a plan in mind for you. And His intent was to cause you at some point in your life to change from running your life the way you've been running it, even if you're saved, to your life being available to God for Him to live in you and for Him to live through you. So baptism of the baptism by the Spirit represents a change of location from your government of yourself to your being governed by the Lord, from your being outside of the body corporate of the person of Christ to your being placed into the body corporate of the person of Christ. Baptism of fire is meant to relate to a change in you that, is, that realizes the dominance of the soul giving way to the dominance of the spirit. Your soul governing you to be having your soul saved. The soul is saved through the baptism of fire. And we'll get into that. These are just summaries at this point. And finally, the fourth of the baptisms I wish to present is baptism in water. And baptism in water is meant to convey to you that Adam no longer rules and your identity is no longer that of a sinner, that that person will die and give way to a new person who is raised with Christ and indeed who becomes a new creature, even a new creation in Christ. Death and resurrection then are the results of the, the teaching on baptism in water. Now, needless to say, the doctrine then of baptisms is not just old school stuff. What is astonishing to me is that so many of the older people who were taught baptism have only been taught either water baptism or baptism in the Spirit and they choose between water baptism and baptism in the Spirit. And there's a whole generation of people, many of whom are under the age of 30, who have never been taught anything about baptisms. And so the changes that are foundational, elementary, elemental to your process, that guarantees a certain platform on which you can stand with certainty, with security. That foundation not being laid, people are wishy-washy, they're wobbling. And that's why when for the time many are to be teachers, they're still battling with foundational elementary things and are not sure. Sometimes there are people who have been in, in the Lord They've been saved for 20 and 30 years and if you press them, they're still not even sure they were saved. How does God put a foundation under you that establishes this truth in you and from which there is no, no going back? The answer is through the doctrine of baptisms. So for the purposes of this series on baptisms, we will begin with the baptism of the Spirit. Baptism of the Spirit, I will point out, is the baptism of Jesus. It is the baptism with which Jesus baptizes. I'd like for us to turn to the book of Acts 
the first chapter. And here is what Jesus himself says in the very first part of the book of Acts. Here it is. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, this is just before Jesus was taken up into heaven. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, you will note that the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what? But you will receive power when the, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now, the coming on you of the Holy Spirit has been previously described in the verse just above where we read in these terms, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Spirit. Now, let's move further into this discussion. In the book of Luke, the third chapter, John makes this declaration. In Luke 3, John the Baptist is baptizing. And here is, and Jesus comes to him, and this is what Luke says about this, uh, this subject. John the Baptist is speaking and he says, verse 7 of uh, Luke 3, John said to the crowds coming to him, you brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath of God to come? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And then John said, there's one coming after me, this is verse uh, 15, the people were expectantly looking at John and wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. So at that point then John gives this answer, verse 16, John answered them all, I baptize with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is what John said. John said that the one who was coming after him would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I submit to you then that the baptism of Jesus Christ, that is, when Jesus baptizes you, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Is that not what John said? I baptize with water, but there is one who is coming after me, and he was referring to Jesus. When he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I lived a number of years thinking that the baptism of Jesus was water baptism. How foolish. No, the baptism of Jesus, the baptism with which Jesus baptizes you is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the clearest of evidence in Scripture. I baptize you with water, John says, but one is coming after me whose shoes I am not worthy to untie when he comes, and he was referring to Jesus, 
And he said, when Jesus comes, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But in the course of his life on the earth, there was no one whom Jesus baptized in the Spirit. And it's Jesus who is now saying in Acts 1, it's in red letter, it's the passages we read, Acts 1, 4. For John baptized with water, verse 5, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now who, who are the ones with whom Jesus was speaking? It says, He appeared unto them. The them were the Holy, what the Holy Spirit gave instructions to the apostles. The twelve disciples were the ones particularly spoken of here, but we know that there was a hundred and twenty of them who were baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. All right? At this point, Jesus is saying to his disciples, to the twelve in particular, not many days from now, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It means that he had not baptized them with the Holy Spirit while he was alive on, with them on the earth. What happens between Acts 1 where we've just read and Acts 2 where the Holy Spirit comes on them and baptizes them, what happens is Jesus goes back to heaven. While they beheld, Acts chapter 1 verse 11, while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now here is the point. The last thing that Jesus promised them was that not many days from the moment he spoke that promise, not many days from then, he would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And we know that he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight, Acts 1.11, and it was not until ten days later, on the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit came to them and baptized them. All right? The point is conclusively then that Jesus baptized no one with the Holy Spirit while he was still on the earth. He baptized no one. That's the clarity of the point. Jesus has baptized no one from the earth with his spirit. Well, what about the fact that Jesus breathed on his disciples before he went back to heaven and said to his disciples, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is at the end of, I believe, the book of Matthew. There is a distinction between receiving the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and receiving the baptism of the Spirit. What is the distinction? The distinction is that the indwelling of the Spirit as a gift to the believer is meant to confirm that you are born again of God. The baptism of the Spirit, however, is meant to impart power. Two very different things. So when a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Acts 2.38, where the promise was to us, to them and to their children and to even the Gentiles, Peter said, if you repent and are baptized, you'll receive the gift of the Spirit and the same language is used as when, Jesus, when the scriptures say Jesus breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. So what Jesus was doing when he breathed on his disciples and said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost, he was confirming them as being born from above. He did not leave the earth without confirming his disciples as being born of God. His disciples were born again and they were born again by Jesus breathing on them and imparting the Holy Spirit to them to confirm with their spirits that they were the children of God. So says Romans 8, 11, for the Spirit himself testifies with our spirits. There's a mutuality of fellowship 
between the Holy Spirit and the human spirit and in that mutuality there is a seal, the, imp the imprint of the Holy Spirit, the seal of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is that you are born again of God and that God is your Father. But you know how many, many people there are in the churches who are not going to hell because they are the sons of God, they were saved, but they have no power, they have no power. And in fact, they have even come up with this silly doctrine that says you shouldn't seek God for power, you should seek God for Himself. That's to create a dichotomy where there is no dichotomy. You should seek God for Himself, but He also gives you power. And in fact, the, the, the Scriptures make it very plain. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are the specific gifts of the power of Jesus Christ delegated through the Holy Spirit meant to be operational in the church. Jesus did not make the mistake of sending His disciples out into the world to declare the message of the Kingdom to the, to the unsaved world without empowering them. Why? Because there is an enemy who holds the world in captivity. And if you go out into the world armed with no more than what used to be the fad a few years back, which is a vinyl Bible cover, with a picture of a sword cut out in the vinyl, if you go out into the world with no more than a vinyl Bible cover with a sword in it, thinking that, that your knowledge, your, your, your religious knowledge of the Scriptures was going to defeat the enemy where you went, no wonder so many of our young people, full of enthusiasm and totally unprepared to operate in the power of the Spirit, charged out into the world to do battle with the enemy and came back bruised and beaten up and, and not even attending the meetings anymore. Why? Because there is a very entrenched and skillful enemy who is waiting for the unwary and the unsuspecting. And you come out into that realm without power and it's like taking a knife to a gunfight, as someone has said. You lost when you left the house. You find out that you lost when you matched, when you were matched with a power vastly superior to anything that you had the experience with. The reality is then, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus Himself said, was meant to be a conveyance of His power to you in order to match the commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. What ridiculous thinking is it that we should think that Jesus would send us out into the world that is controlled by the demonic without empowering us to do successful battle against the demonic? What guarantee would there be except our failure? The baptism, in the, the baptism of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills you up, is meant to result in your receiving an impartation of the power and the authority that belongs to Jesus Christ working now on your behalf and working through you. Now this requires a little bit more development, so what I want to do in the next broadcast is to talk to you about the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit as His delegate so that the Holy Spirit, who is the delegate of the Lord Jesus Christ, may come and bring the authority of Christ to you. And when He supplies you with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are sufficient to the tasks which involve your calling. Baptisms then are meant to result in change, and the baptism of the Spirit is meant to result specifically in the change from being powerless to being powerful. All of the baptisms will result in some nature of change. So I hope you'll study the doctrine of baptisms with me. I'm Sam Solon. 
continue to study the elementary doctrines with me. We hope you have enjoyed this program, and we would love to hear from you. Please address all correspondence to Sam Solon, Post Office Box 93937, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87199-3937. Or for more information and resources, visit our website at www.solon.org.